Time now is 12 minutes to eight. Good morning. Now, you can be a global success. You can perform in front of millions of fans all over the world. But it's got to still feel special to return to where it all began. Yes, that's what rock and roll legends Def Leppard are doing as they prepare to perform in the home city of Sheffield tomorrow evening. Now, they're starting small. They're playing to just 850 fans. But it is going to mark the start of the band's European tour. We're going to be joined by frontman Joe Elliott in just a moment. First, here's a reminder of some of their biggest hits. Joe's with us now. Morning, Joe. Good morning. Elliot with, with two, two T's. T's. And sugar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it always gets, I'm sure that always gets missed. Yeah, it does. I once had a, um, a gold disc from the record company that they'd spelt my name with one T, and I gave it back and I said, you wouldn't give one to Prince that said rinse, would you? <laughs> <laughs> they'd spell your name wrong yeah, on your yeah. gold disc. Yeah. Did, yeah. That's not Did good. they redo it? Did they redo this, it? this is right on the passport, that's all that matters. <laughs> you, do you know, we were sitting here watching some of those, uh, some of the older videos, some of the new stuff. Every every picture's got a story, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, blimey. So they go, them, the one right at the beginning, which was the one where you were, uh, sorry, I've forgotten which song it was, Knocking Down the they House. put some sugar on me, yeah. It was okay. the original bad video, as we call it. And you were smashing down a house. We were smashing down a house in an area called Still Organ in Dublin, which I drive past because I live there. And every time I drive into town, I drive past it. And it was a little sigh of like, uh, because it was a real, a, you were a actually. a nice building there now, but the one that was there before, we helped destroy it. You actually were not yeah, we were, they did, they were destroying it anyway, so they let us in for a day to save them some effort, you know. How much fun. I can't imagine the health and safety forms were out No, there. back in those days, you got away with it. Got away with it. Um, going back home to Sheffield. Yes, our birth town, yeah. Yeah, small gig. The lead mill. 850 people. Yeah. How does the performance change, if at all? What does, and how does it feel for you in terms of being different? It's like getting back on a bike. You know, I mean, we've been playing stadiums or the arenas for years and years and years, but we do occasionally do like a, a special show like this on, on little stages, and you, you never forget. In fact, the, in fairness, it's the early days you kind of remember the best because it's when you're first starting out, and it's 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 what gives you your your opportunity to become a band is playing small venues, which is why we're going back to the to the lead mill and we're doing it and all the all the um, the net profits are all going to charity to to help keep the lead mill alive. There's there's a campaign we've we've been involved with on social media for over a year now, you know, save the lead mill. But it's not just the lead mill, it's from Aberdeen to Yeovil, there's clubs closing on a on a places. weekly basis. So you know, it's um, it's the performance doesn't change. We just don't move around as much because <laughs> there's really no space. Does the scrutiny feel? And this is a it's not a question because you know you're playing in front of thousands in the big stadium, right? Fine, but when it's 850 and you know people would have fought for those tickets, mm -hmm. they would have been following you really closely. They'll be real kind of hardcore fans. Does the scrutiny feel more intense, or do you feel that you have to give them something a little bit more? personal yeah. a little bit more it is a little bit more personal we're playing a completely different set of songs than we would play say four days later at Bramall Lane um, and it's also going out live on the radio so no pressure um, but yeah you know you, you, you do see the whites of their eyes but it's it's for you know it's an hour long set it's a short set really it's just so it's a special event so you just you get into the zone that's what you have to do because you you can still see the whites of their eyes in the stadium but only for the first 10 rows mm. and then after that it's just like looking at a crowd at a football match 
you have had incredible success over the years, but do you remember times, and we're talking about doing small gigs, when you were playing to people who basically weren't listening or weren't paying much attention? Or Do you, do you remember those days? And where, does it mean you cherish these moments all the more? Yes, to all the above. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we see, we never split. So it's not like we reformed to grab some past glory. What we did was during, you know, the wilderness years, as we always like to call them, which is like the 90s into the noughties, where we still had an audience in certain places of the world that was pretty big, but it was based on, on past glories, if you like. But then he started building back up again, you know, and we've always seen it as turbulence. If you keep going, eventually you come out the other side and it's, it's a bit smoother. It's quite a good philosophy, that. And tell me about the voice, because we often ask artists about their voices and how they maintain them, and if you worry about their, ch their changing. It's a good thing, maybe. How about you? Well, I don't think my hair's white. I worry <laughs> about everything. Um, I lost my voice quite badly about eight years ago, and a doctor that I saw said, well, you know, if it wasn't you, I'd tell you to change your profession. Mm. But uh, a vocal coach that we've been working with for about 30 years, he just said to me, oh, poppycock, you know. And he built me up again without any surgery. And so when you say you lost your voice, was there nothing? It, was, it, it just went to, I just couldn't control anything. I had a frozen vocal cord is what it was. Okay. And apparently they don't normally come back, but with, that, with exercise, it's, I guess it's like a dry rubber band. If you massage enough oil back into it, it will become springy again. And that's what happened. My vocal cords wouldn't meet in the middle because this one was frozen, but then it would. And now I'm better than I've ever been. So oh, it, that's my vocal coach, Roger Love. It does sound, when you sing, that you're battering your vocal cords. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, they take a good hammer in. Because I was doing an impression of you this morning to one of our young, <laughs> I would love young to runners. Have seen that. <laughs> you wouldn't, actually. I was singing one of your songs to one of our younger runners who, who wasn't familiar which with Which song running. was it? It was. It, it was. Joe might like to know which song it, it was. Would you like to know? It was animal. Okay. It was animal. But when I did it, I was like, "Oh, I feel it's a bit sore now." Because you really do give it. A it's like battery. everything. You get used to it a certain way, but you know, it, it's manage. It's management of it. That's all. You know, I listen. I don't do three shows in a row. Not anymore. When we, the reason that we don't is because you, you find a level. You go. This third show is. I can't do it as well as. So, you know, show one and two. So you change your schedule and make it work. So it's all about ex expanding the band's career. We can do the exactly the same amount of shows, but you do them over a 15 year period rather than 12, you're still doing all the shows. And also expanding your reach because Drastic Symphonies, I mean, yeah, you wouldn't naturally put Def Leppard with a full blown orchestra. No, it's it wasn't something on our bucket list either, but um, during the pandemic, we managed to record a, a brand new album, Diamond Star Halos, which came out about a year ago, when we did it completely remotely from our homes on the west east coast of America, from Sheffield and from Dublin, and glued it all together. Um, and we refused to release that album into the pandemic, so we sat on it for a year, and while we were sat on it, uh, our record label said, do you fancy doing uh, you know, an album with the Royal Philharmonic, and they they mentioned the fact that they'd done Elvis, the Beach Boys, Queen, and we thought, well, this is exalted company, so why not? You know, yeah. so we we chose to the songs that we thought were the most symphonic songs mm. we'd written, some hits and some pretty deep tracks. I bet it sounds Stripped great. Stripped them down and built them back up again, and then we went to Abbey Road, Abbey Road and uh, watched them for two days do their bit, and it was absolutely astonishing. Um, I know that the book is called Definitely the Official Story of Def Leppard. What's the maddest uh, nonsense myth you've heard about the band? Because often there's mythology that builds up around rock bands. What's the maddest one? Well, I think the maddest one was my death in a plane crash. That you, know, you died? Yeah, yeah. the uh, news of my death have been hugely exaggerated, I think somebody once mm -hmm. said. Um, yeah, I went down in a plane crash. That's probably the maddest one, really. But no, I'm still here. It's good to get that confirmed, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's good to get that confirmed. <laughs> it's a great book, though. I mean, it goes all the way back to the beginning. You know, I mean, I did so, we all did so many hours of talking that it was like therapy, you know, and you, 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 you say certain things and then it triggers another yeah. memory. Yeah. And then all the, you know, my mom, bless her, keeps, or kept a scrapbook. You know, and I managed to find it, and it's like we had all these press cuttings from 1977, 78. Oh, Crazy, wow. you know. Oh, all in there. Uh, lovely seeing you here this morning. Really Thank lovely. You. Good luck with the gig. It's tomorrow or tonight? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. And then Bramall Lane on Monday is the start and of the uh, European tour. Good luck with the tour program. as well. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, John. <laughs> Um, of course, uh, the new album, Drastic Symphonies, we were talking about, is out tomorrow, and the tour, of course, kicks off next week. 
Uh, so, uh, from one rock legend to another this morning, we're talking about Sting as well. Why, I'm on. Rocks! You don't have to put on the rocks! As well as sounding like that, according to some, his songs are known by millions all over the world. He's joining the likes of Elton John and Paul McCartney. He's been awarded one of the music's worst, highest honours. We're going to hear what it means for him just before 8 o'clock this morning. I like Joe chipping in just then as well. Uh, time to get the news, the travel, and the weather where you are. See you in a bit. Thank you, Joe. Hello, good morning. Repairs to the Calmac ferry fleet have cost more than £100 million in the last five years. That's according to figures released by Calmac to the Scottish Lib Dems. They say the figures highlight a decade of poor planning by SNP ministers. Calmac says its maintenance bill is up 70% since 2017. The Scottish Government says it's invested more than £2 billion in ferry services since 2007.